Hello, I'm Armin Budish. Welcome to Golden Opportunities. Today, feel a tingle in your toes and fire in your feet? We'll offer a top technique to tame the pain. Then, what's happening with healthcare reform? We'll check up on how well it's doing. You bought low and now stocks are high. Should you fold or hold? Plus, we'll get to the heart of your constant heartburn. And does a divorce divorce you from your ex-spouse's social security benefit? It's time to get GOing, so pull up a chair and join us at our kitchen table for Golden Opportunities. A mystery is afoot, and it focuses on feet. If your feet are on pins and needles, you need to learn why they're socked with pain and burning. Dr. Noel Abood may just have the answer as well as the solution. Dr. Abood is with the Soul and Spine and Wellness Center. Thanks for joining us, doctor. Thank you. Pain, burning, sensitivity, pins and needles, what's all this about? It's awful when you have something called peripheral neuropathy and the viewers that are out there that have it know about the burning in the feet and the tingling and the numbness. It even affects your balance. And this is related often to diabetes, isn't it? Sixty percent of the cases of neuropathy have diabetes. The other forty percent are a variety of reasons. So what, what makes these symptoms happen? What happens is you're, you need a constant uh, circulation of blood flow to the foot and when you're not getting good flow the waste product is not being pulled out of the foot and that waste product builds up in the feet and it eats away at the nerve fibers and that's what causes the the pain and symptoms so uh, what can happen if this is not treated or taken care of just the pain you or can, can lose it get worse? they can amputate your toes your feet wow. it's really it's really a difficult condition to deal with and right now there's just nothing other than medication to treat the symptoms well there is something right you're going to tell us about something yeah, and that's what we've been excited to start using is something called the True Tesla Neurostimulator. Just a big word for what it means is there's sticky pad electrodes we put on the feet and it contracts and relaxes these deep muscles where my hands can't reach at, increases blood flow by 500% and by doing that it allows the new nerve tissue to to some degree regrow and develop and, and heal. Now, you mentioned medications. Are there medications? I assume that there's also uh, surgery. Uh, is there, but those things we all know s often have side effects. Uh, any side effects with this stimulation? With this stimulation unit, there is no, no side effects at all, and we're able to use it on all sorts of patients, whether they're di diabetic or whether they've had chemotherapy that caused this neuropathy, and, it, and the results have been really encouraging up to this point. All right, so you've got the stimulation. It gets the blood moving. Uh, does it hurt? No, it feels good. You'll actually see your feet and your toes move and contract as because it's contracting the muscles for you. And when you haven't been walking much and you haven't been moving, this is exercising for you. So it's really important to do this routine. Uh, I always look for ways to exercise for me, so I don't have to, but that's another story. <laughs> I, so I understand How that. do we know if this is working? How do we know if it does it? Uh, Great point. And, and to us and to our patients, it's how do they feel? Are they feeling better? Are they able to sleep now? Are they able to walk with better balance? Can they um, feel the hot floor underneath their feet? That, the symptoms. And, and do we have a picture of... Um, there is a picture, and I, I, if we put it up, it's graphic. And I want you to see on the left-hand side, that's the foot that's eaten away by a ooh. person with diabetic neuropathy. But ooh. look at on the picture on the right. That's after two months, or t uh, yes, two months of treatment, you can see how the body begins to heal. And what I like about it is it's not just a pill that makes you feel better, your body starts to heal itself from the inside out. And so this procedure can do a number of things for us. Tell us about what the specifics are. Um, uh, you made a list for me, um, it helps with your mobility. Um, your ability to walk, mobility, Feeling is restored into the feet and just comfort, quality of life symptoms, get you to be able to walk again. Many of these people can't even walk to the grocery store at this point. And it says restore normal sensations. Um, so that means that you don't have this uh, uh, numbness? Right. Or we've had patients that spill hot soup on their foot and don't feel it and burn their foot. Oh so it's gosh. dangerous. So they begin, you'll begin to start feeling again. 
well, and the feet. Appreciate your bringing this information to us. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. It's no mystery why we want to be pain-free. A treatment plan of neurostimulation might help you heal right down to your toes. For more information, give Dr. Abud a call. His number's up next. Learn more by calling Solon Spine and Wellness Center or log on to www.solonbackpain.com. Next, ensuring the health of your health insurance. But first, while most would not consider fungus a favorite food, truffles are touted as tops for haute cuisine, making them a trifle expensive. Can you name the top dollar one gentleman paid for this elite ingredient? We'll sprout the record-breaking answer when we return. My husband and I got into the car and we couldn't do it. We couldn't pick one baby over the other. Coming to Metro changed the entire pregnancy. We actually started to become happy with, with our situation. We owe a big thank you to Metro. I can't imagine our family without Sam. Once called the diamonds of the kitchen, truffles can cost almost as much. The fancy fungi can fetch up to $400 an ounce. But one true truffle fanatic, Macau Casino owner Stanley Ho, supersized that price, paying a record $330,000 for a single white truffle weighing 3.3 pounds, one of the largest fungi ever found. When the Affordable Care Act, which is known as Obamacare by most people, when it was passed, there was a promise that if you liked your coverage, you could keep it. But this hasn't proven to be true in many cases. What happened? Let's ask Greg Young, Director of Strategic Policy and Initiatives at Medical Mutual of Ohio. Thanks for joining us again, Greg. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Grandfathering. It was written into the Affordable Care Act, so where'd it go? You're right, it was written in, and the intent of grandfathering was for plans that were in existence prior to the passage of that law, March 23rd, 2010, people could maintain them. But what happened is, in June of 2010, the departments of HHS, Health and Human Services, Treasury, you know, Labor released regulations that were meant to define the rules for grandfathering. Well, those rules were very restrictive. So if plans made any changes of any significance, they lost those grandfathered plans. Huh. So can you give us an example or two? Sure can. Um, you know, every plan has a defined group of benefits. So let's say that uh, one of the benefits in your plan was significantly altered or removed. Then you lost your grandfathered status. Or, you know, you worked for... You like know, a, a coverage benefit? Absolutely. Or? Let's say you had autism, okay. and, and that was altered or taken out of the plan, then you I lost see. your grandfather's status. Then you lose status. the whole plan. Absolutely. I see. Um, or if you had a scenario where your employer was helping pay for the cost of the coverage, reduced their contribution by more than 5%, and then again, you lost that grandfathered plan. I see. Um, what was interesting, when those regulations came out, I think it was the Department of Treasury made a list of uh, predictions, if you will, uh, about the number of uh, people who would lose those grandfathered plans. It was pretty significant. Significant to the point where a number of insurers just went ahead and didn't even try and maintain grandfathered plans. So uh, what happened to those people who were not able to keep their coverage. Well, what happened is, especially in the individual market, they were okay until 2014 because they could purchase coverage that kind of resembled what they had and wasn't really that different. But now in 2014, as all these new mandates kicked in, they've looked at a, a very different, more expensive product. So uh, tell me about the impact on those with employer-sponsored plans. With the employer-sponsored plan, at least in 2014, it's not as big a deal. There were a number of changes that were made. For instance, if, if you're in a large employer group where um, there's 100 plus employees, there was going to be a penalty in 2014 where if your employer either dropped your coverage 
or didn't bring it up to the new ACA standards, they would pay a penalty. Well, that was removed by the president for 2014. So the impact has not been as large on that segment. All right, and when folks then signed up for the new health plans through Obamacare, Mm -hmm. what, are, what, would, what did people find? Well, what they found was the type of product they were getting, the plan they were getting was very different. Um, Better, worse? or Well, I mean, there were a number of new mandates. For, for, for example, essential health benefits. So um, if you're an individual purchasing a plan, it was almost like there was a standardization of the benefits that you had to have in that plan. So what that did is it drove cost up. So it meant two things. It meant that people who had coverage, they were canceled. That's why we heard about the five million plus cancellations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then when they went to get coverage, it looked very different than what they had before. It was more expensive. And I want to talk to you again, I, we're, we're out of time now, but about the subsidies, maybe mm -hmm. we can get you back in a couple weeks. Sounds and, great, thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Always good information. Thank you. Very important, but very complicated Absolutely. topic. Making changes in something as big as health care, it's bound to bring bumps. The good news is that those who had private plans before can still get coverage, and those who were unable to get coverage before can do it now. It's complicated, though. <laughs> Everybody knows that. So for help, contact Medical Mutual. My thanks to Greg for joining us today. Thank you. Find out more about Medical Mutual of Ohio by visiting their website, www.medmutual.com. Next, if your stocks are high, should you say goodbye? Looking for places to go, things to do? Welcome to our community calendar. If fresh produce is your passion, don't let winter keep you planted at home. The North Union Farmer's Market has sprouted on Saturdays at Crocker Park and Shaker Square and includes features from the farm along with goods from bakers and artisans. To harvest more information, call 216 751-7656 or dig into their website www.northunionfarmersmarket.org The stock market, it's record highs. Your investments are making gains and all's right with your financial world. So now it might seem like the perfect time to hold on to your stocks. But Jim Lineweaver says you might want to consider folding your hand. Jim's a certified financial planner with the Line Weaver Financial Group, and he's here with ideas on how to evaluate your investments. Thanks for joining us, Jim. My pleasure. So if our investments are doing so well, why would we ever want to get rid of those? Well, what you have to do is you got to get the emotions out of individual investors. And what they always fail to remember is their fear and greed usually is the detriment of their portfolio over time. So when you really look at the history of the stock market and what's occurred in the last several years, and we actually have some graphics for your viewers, the problem is that we've had a great run-up in the market and you really got to... Uh, take note of that. So what happened is just in the last year, you know, the market's up considerably in 2013, one of the best markets that we've had in a long time. Mm -hmm. but if you go back to the crash of what happened back in those, you know, 8 and 09, you know, we're up probably, you know, over 20 some percent off of the highs of 2007 and we're all, also up almost 200 percent from the lows. So don't get greedy. What, has, what ends up happening is your equity sectors that have done real well, you may want to take some of those profits off the table, or you can also move those to other sectors that might be the next darling, because they very seldom repeat themselves from so, one year to the next. So give us, tell us, like, what kind of questions should we be asking ourselves as we review our investments? Well, what happens is you want to look at rebalancing, because your chances are if you had some equity exposure back in 08, 09, and you were prudent, maybe got some investments at that time in the equity exposure, they probably had a great run-up. So you're probably taking on more risk than you really realize. So look at rebalancing your portfolio. Take some of those gains off the table. Don't be greedy. And then what you also want to do is just make sure you have good emergency funds set aside so that you don't dip into credit cards and other things along that nature. So it, it, just so I understand what you said, so if, if we targeted, let's say, 50% of our investments in stock market mm -hmm. and our stocks have gone up, now we might find that we've got 60 or 70% of our investments in the market, which was not what we intended. Right. And that's why you're saying maybe rebalance, sell some of the... Yeah, before even though you potentially up. lose that, if, if there is a market correction or the government doesn't get some of those debt issues correct, you want to maybe take some of that off the table. For what it. if we just feel comfortable with buy and hold? 
Uh, you can, but uh, the problem is uh, you can really expose yourself to a lot of risk. And that, you know, people have short-term memories, but if you remember the, back to the crash of 2002, what recently happened in 07 and 08, you really want to make sure that you're being prudent with your investments. So you've said uh, before, regularly reevaluate your portfolio. How regular is regularly? Are we talking weekly, monthly, annually, decadely? You know, what is well, the... Well, somebody should be staying on top of it on a regular basis. That may be weekly or monthly, okay? But you want to make sure you're tracking. You know, don't, don't make immediate, res you know, changes based on just what happened in a given day. But you want to make sure on a six-month, quarterly, annually basis that you're staying on track with your overall investments. And a good rule of thumb for investors is always 100 minus your age is all the amount of money that you want to have at risk. So just take 100, subtract your age, and if that amount of risk is out of line right now, then look at rebalancing to get it back in check. And because all this is complicated but important, you have a program that people can get more information. Yeah, we're not only going to talk about this, but strategies for investments in 2014. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this on Tuesday, January 21st at 6.30 at our Valley View office and also Thursday, January 23rd at 1 p.m. Great. Always good information. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Whether you decide to cash in some chips or play the hand that's been dealt to you, make your choice after seeing all the cards. Take time to reevaluate your portfolio. Rising stock values may have cost too much of your investments to be in stocks right now. If you need help or you want more information, give Jim a call. Go to one of the seminars. His number's up next. For more information, call the Line Weaver Financial Group at 1 888 313 4009 or log on to www.lineweaver.net. Next, when a simple swallow brings searing pain. It's time to get up and go an exercise minute on golden opportunities. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Carvin from Breakout Fitness and today we're here to show you how to stretch the ever important hamstrings in the back of the leg. These muscles are very important because not only do they help us get around, but they help us get up and down stairs. You ready to show them how to stretch them out? I'm ready. Alright, let's do it. We're going to start seated on the ground. Here in the studio we have our mats. You at home, any firm surface you feel comfortable sitting on will do. We want to make sure we maintain good posture and have our feet out in front of us. All we're going to do is try to keep the backs of our legs on the ground as we lean and try to grab our toes. So feel a good little stretch. We're going to hold it for a 5 to 10 count. And then we're going to go ahead and relax. Let's try it one more time there, see if we can get a little bit further. How you doing, Armand? Uh, my arms are too short. <laughs> Good job. Keep practicing. Get out there. Keep the back straight. You're doing fine. We're looking there for we five to it. ten seconds. Hey! <laughs> we're looking for five to ten seconds. Two or three times will get you nice and warmed up. And now it's your turn to get up and go. For your copy of the exercise booklet, please send one dollar for postage to Golden Opportunities, 23240 Chagrin Boulevard, Suite 450, Beachwood, Ohio, 44122. It's good when something warms your heart. It's bad when something makes your heart burn. Indigestion is often acid, re acid reflux. And here to reflect on reflux is the top doc, not the second or third, the top doc for this topic, Dr. Ran Ronnie Fast from Metro Health. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So you really are the top doc in the world. Uh, you know, you've been uh, 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 described by that, uh, uh, by uh, ex Expertscape. Um, I mean, that's fabulous. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the director of gastroenterology and hepatology and the head of the esophageal center at Metro Health. And uh, you've set up an advanced swallowing center. Um, so uh, I guess the place to start is what is GERD? So the word GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, many of us experience heartburn from time to time, but uh, this is not gastroesophageal reflux disease. All right, so when you, uh, how do you know? I mean, what, tell me about the symptoms and, and how do we know what we have? Gastroesophageal reflux disease, and the emphasis is on the word disease, is when you have a dysfunction of the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach. And this is a type of muscle that prevents from food coming back into our esophagus and also from acid coming back into the esophagus, which is gastroesophageal reflux. When you develop uh, symptoms like heartburn, uh, you develop symptoms like uh, uh, feeling uh, food that is getting stuck in your esophagus, uh, symptoms that getting worse when you are in the upright position, 
uh, worse at night in particular, relieved by antacids, and if you have nausea after eating, all of those uh, constitute gastroesophageal reflux disease. All right, so these symptoms you've just described, they clearly make you uncomfortable. Are they actually dangerous to our health? Uh, in general, they affect our quality of life and they do affect our daily living, but in some patients they may cause inflammation, they may result in narrowing of the lower part of the esophagus, and then in about 6 to 12 percent of the patients with heartburn, they, their normal esophageal lining is replaced by stomach lining. This is what huh. we call Barrett's esophagus, and if you have Barrett's esophagus, it puts you at risk of developing uh, cancer of the esophagus, Ooh. which is the fastest rising cancer right now in the United States. So what can we do to prevent GERD uh, from occurring in the very first place? Well, our low uh, the, the low-hanging fruit, of course, is uh, lifestyle uh, changes, like avoid alcohol, um, avoid caffeinated foods and drinks, decaffeinated coffee, high acid fruits, vegetables, spearmint, peppermint, as well as others. Okay, and then uh, you've got a list of life changes as well. Yeah, eat smaller meals, lose weight if necessary, quit smoking, uh, do exercise, reduce uh, stress in your life, and even avoid clothes uh, that are tight. Uh, that's probably what we call easy to do. Yeah, okay, but now <laughs> let's say you got the GERD and you, we want to treat it. What can we do to treat it? We talked about the lifestyle changes, right. and these are something that you can do. Other things, you can use antacids if you have heartburn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have over-the-counter medication or prescription medications, and in some patients, uh, we can even offer surgery. At what stage do you go see a doctor about it rather than just pop an antacid? If you start to have repeated symptoms on a regular basis, uh, if your symptoms are associated with uh, something like problem swallowing food, uh, all of those are indications to come and see, see your physician doctor. and get some more uh, exploration of your problem. Thank you very much, doctor. Appreciate that very much. Thank you for having me. It's absurd to not try to stop your GERD. Follow Dr. Fast's advice to minimize GERD or even to keep it from occurring in the first place. And if you need more help, use the information that's coming up next. My thanks to the world's best, Dr. Fast, for stopping by our part of the world today. Find out more by calling MetroHealth at 216-778-7800 or visit www.metrohealth.org. Want more MetroHealth medical information? Be sure to tune in to WTAM 1100 each Saturday morning at 7 for MetroHealth and You, hosted by Dr. Christine Alexander. Next, don't lose out on Social Security benefits even after a divorce. Welcome to Breckenridge Village, a continuing care retirement community conveniently located in historic Willoughby, Ohio. Whether it's a luxury apartment, a spacious ranch home, or newly built brownstones, it's all here. With the added security of knowing more care is available when you need it. Breckenridge Village offers an exciting and upbeat lifestyle. And the food is fabulous, and our staff makes you their number one priority. Learn more about Breckenridge Village and come see our new Veal Wellness and Aquatic Center. Does a divorce divorce you from your ex-spouse's Social Security benefits? Or can you still collect based on your ex's work record? And does it matter if your ex-spouse hasn't even retired yet? Here to make sure you benefit from all the Social Security benefits that you're entitled to is my law partner who's always secure in his tips and advice, Mike Solomon. Thanks yeah, for joining us, Mike. So if you're divorced, can you still collect Social Security benefits based on an ex-spouse's work record? Well, you can, but there are four requirements. Uh, number one, you shouldn't, you can't get remarried. Number two, you had to be married at least 10 years to that ex-spouse. Number three, you have to be eligible, you know, 62. Mm -hmm. And then and number four, finally, your ex-spouse has to be eligible for Social Security. Okay, so you, let's start with, you, you said the ex-spouse has to be eligible for, for benefits. What if your ex-spouse isn't actually receiving benefits yet? Well, that's okay, as long as the ex-spouse has satisfied the requirements. So, for example, if your ex-spouse is 62 and is, is eligible for Social Security at that point, even if they're not collecting, if they're still working, let's say, uh, you can still collect. Does Social it matter Security. how long you've been divorced? I mean, what if you just got divorced? Well, yes and no. 
If your ex-spouse is already on Social Security, it doesn't matter. Then you can apply, assuming you satisfy the age requirements. If, um, if you, your ex-spouse is not yet applied for Social Security, then you have to wait two years after your divorce before you can get it. Does your ex-spouse's age affect the amount of your benefits? No. As long as your ex-spouse is eligible, then, and then you're eligible, you're, you're, you can get the Social Security. Your, your age the, uh, is going to impact it. So, for example, if you've hit full retirement age, the, the divorced spouse, then you can get up to one half of your ex-spouse's uh, benefit. If you're 62 to 66, you know, right now the normal retirement age for most people is 66. If you're between those ages, 62 and 66, you get less than one half. Now, what if your ex-spouse had gotten remarried? Does that make any difference at all? Uh, not on Social Security. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. This is great information, Mike. Appreciate it very much. You won't be X'd out of your ex spouse's Social Security benefits, but the rules can be complicated. Don't make a mistake and lose out. For more information, give Mike Solomon a call. Call Butish, Solomon, Steiner, and Peck at 1 888 236 5173 for more information or to schedule a speaker for your organization or log on to www.butishandsolomon.com Thanks for joining us today. On next week's show, we'll discuss how to deal with diabetes after your diagnosis. We'll discover how downsizing can enlarge your lifestyle and are your teeth not at their top? We'll get to the bottom of your dental difficulties. Until next week, please remember to make the most of your golden opportunities. Would you like to join our kitchen conversation? All you have to do is call toll-free 1-877-765-1543 and leave us your question, name, and phone number. Or log on to www.golden.tv for all the latest information and show updates.